In my previous video, I showed the unboxing of this big time Nixie clock by Mr. Nixie. I had planned to release this follow up video the very next week, but life got in the way and I ran into some issues with the clock itself. While the clock isn't as perfect as I would have liked it to be, I've decided to call this done for now. The N18 Nixie tubes used in this clock are the largest ones that the Soviet Union made, and in my opinion at least, they're also the most beautiful. The digits are nicely shaped, and unlike many of the other Soviet tubes, they use a true 5 instead of an upside down 2 as a 5. This clock has a number of features, all of which are controlled by this remote control. The only button on the clock itself is the reset button, and if you press that, it'll scroll through all the digits. And then chime and hopefully get back to the correct time. The clock is GPS controlled, so this time should be dead on. That's a nice feature. It does of course add to the cost of the clock, but this was a high-end clock. Here's the manual and constructor's guide for the clock. This side is the owner's guide, and then the other side is the constructor's guide. There's also this laminated quick reference guide. It shows you how to use the remote control and what all the parameters are in the settings menu. This remote control doesn't have very many buttons and I wish they had used them a little bit differently to be honest. Pressing the power button brings up the temperature display. See it says 78. It's a bit warm in here right now and the clock gives off a fair bit of heat. Here's the temperature probe. That was included with the kit, but you have to assemble it yourself. It's fairly responsive. While you can select between display in Celsius and Fahrenheit, you cannot adjust the offset of the temperature. So if the temperature is incorrect, there's really not much you can do about that, unfortunately. By pressing almost any one of the other buttons on the remote, you can display the date. Personally, I wish they had used one or two buttons for the date, and one of the other pairs of buttons here for the temperature, and then use the power button to turn on and off the high voltage supply of the clock. That would have been nice. And some other clocks do have that feature. You can adjust quite a few things though, as you can see here. I'm not going to read off all the options. The clock does have a chimes feature, but I find that sort of thing generally annoying, especially in a clock that uh, is located in my bedroom. So that's turned off. This clock does have the relay option installed, but I don't have anything connected to that. At the bottom of the features list, you'll see it allows you the option to set four birthdays in here. Now that feature is honestly more annoying than it is useful. I didn't bother setting those up and at least one of them defaulted to being on. So I got woken up at 7.30 in the morning on a random day of the week by this clock playing a little birthday tune. It's uh, not the sort of happy birthday I want to be honest. I'd rather not be woken up early just to hear a little chime. I wasn't sure how to turn that off. Uh, in my half awake state so I just unplugged the clock to uh, put a stop to that. So if you do have one of these make sure you uh, either set the birthday to the days you want it to go off or just turn that feature off. With the exception of some of the electrolytic capacitors I originally built this clock using the components provided in the kit. I also substituted my own higher quality DC adapter as the included one was a cheap generic unit that exhibited more current leakage from the AC line to the metal case of the clock than I am willing to tolerate. If the chassis ground hadn't been connected to the cabinet, I might have used the included adapter, but it was, so I just was not happy with that situation. While the clock did work fine initially, it ran quite a bit hotter than I like to see, in particular the MOSFET and inductor in the high voltage supply. The clock was drawing 10.5 watts from the line, 
and in addition, some digits were brighter than others. As designed, this clock had a 6.8 kilo ohm resistor from the anode of each tube to the high voltage supply, which is supposed to produce 170 volts. In order to extend the life of both the tubes and the clock itself, I decided to reduce the current supplied to the Nixie tubes. To do that, I would have to replace all six anode resistors, which meant disassembling the clock again. After some experimenting with my bench high voltage supply, I settled on 10 kilo ohm anode resistors, as that fully lit all the digits of the two tubes I tried it with. My PV Electronics N18 Nixie clock also uses 10 kilo ohm anode resistors, with no issues in the full brightness mode at least, so I was expecting the same result. While this change worked initially, several tubes quickly developed dark spots, especially on the 8 and 9 digits. I had checked the high voltage supply in the clock itself when I first built it, and it was producing around 170 volts unloaded. With the tubes installed though, the high voltage supply was putting out around 168 volts, a bit less than the 172 volts the manual calculated as an expected value, but not so much that you would think it would cause an issue in operation. However, these large N18 Nixie tubes have a higher voltage drop than some smaller Nixies do, and it varies both between digits and between tubes. It can be as low as 130 volts and as high as 150 volts. With a 168 volt supply, it means that the voltage dropped by the anode resistors varies from 38 volts to just 18 volts, which causes a substantial variation in cathode current. While using a low anode resistance of 6.8 kilo ohms kept the digits with a higher voltage drop fully lit, it also really hammered some of the other digits with a lower voltage drop. I decided to take a different approach and raise the high voltage supply up to 175 volts. As designed, this clock has a fixed high voltage supply whose output voltage is set by a pair of resistors that form a voltage divider. Specifically, this 1.5 mega ohm resistor here, R18, and this 22 kilo ohm resistor here, R14. While some Nixie clocks have a potentiometer for adjusting the output voltage, this one does not. That was arguably a design oversight, as the voltage varies substantially with small changes to the value of the 1.5 mega ohm high side resistor. This one right here. In the interest of not having to potentially repeatedly take the clock all the way apart to change the resistor out, I added a 100 kilo ohm potentiometer in series with the 1.5 mega ohm resistor so that the combined resistance could be adjusted between 1.5 and 1.6 mega ohms. I calculated that this would give me an adjustment range between 170 and 182 volts. With the clock all back together and the tubes installed, I adjusted the high voltage up until it reached 175 volts. You can see the potentiometer I added right there. Mounted underneath it is the 1.5 mega ohm resistor. I'd say my modification looks pretty nice. It doesn't really look out of place. When I replaced the anode resistors, I also upgraded them from quarter watt resistors to half watt resistors. So they're the larger resistors you see. There's the relay for that optional relay output function and its little terminal block. There's a little hole there for you to run wires out of. The clock originally drew 10.5 watts, but with my modifications it now only draws 9 watts, a drop of 2.5 watts. Thankfully some of that reduction in power draw was due to a reduction in heat dissipation in the high voltage supply. The MOSFET and inductors still run hot, but not concerningly so anymore. Initially I was measuring around 150 degrees Fahrenheit on those components, and now they measure between 110 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Not a massive reduction, but enough that it should not impact their life. They can handle that temperature indefinitely. Unfortunately, some of the digits do still exhibit cathode poisoning. I did fix some of them with my bench high voltage supply, running them at a higher current, but it also returned on uh, a few of them, such as this one here. You can see the 8 isn't fully illuminated. It works fine on my bench supply, but not in this clock. I suspect the issue is due to the unusual way in which the tubes are driven. The high voltage driver ICs in this clock were originally designed for VFD tubes, not Nixie tubes. On Nixie tubes, you generally only have one cathode lit at a time, which means the other cathodes are left floating. In order to prevent those unused outputs from being driven up higher than their 80 volt maximum, there's a 75 volt zener here, 
and the unused outputs are pulled up to that voltage. I suspect that that unusual supply design is why some of the digits are not fully lighting up where they are partly obscured by the other cathodes, in particular the eights. Every eight that has a problem has a problem in the same spot where there's a lot of overlapping from the other digits between them and the anode mesh. You can see it there. And also at the top of the eight. This tube here also has an unusual issue. Whenever the digit changes, it makes an annoying pinging sound. It's not super loud, but loud enough to be audible. So I had to move it over to the tens of hours position. So I would only make that noise a few times a day, as opposed to pretty often. Well, thanks for watching, and have a happy 4th of July.